Coming up on Windows Weekly, Leo's out, but thankfully Paul and Mary Jo are here to talk about Microsoft and Motorola both claiming they won the same patent case. That's not really possible. They're on opposite sides. Who's buying RIM? And find out all about Microsoft's plans for Hadoop and more. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley, episode 240, recorded December 22nd, 2011. What's your prestige level? This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Ford, featuring available voice activated sync. Sync gives you versatile access to music, podcasts, and more from just about any device. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog for a free trial and 30% off your new account for three months. Go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code Windows 12. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly, all streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Windows Weekly. The show will recover everything about Microsoft, and you might notice something. I'm clearly not Leo Laporte, and he may or may not be involved in some kind of spy espionage thing right now. We can't really say for sure, or he could be on vacation. It's, it's hard to tell. But thankfully, we are joined by playing the role of Paul Therott is Paul Therott. So this is going to be a natural fit of Win Supersight. How's it going? It was the role I was born to play. That's good. That's very good. And... Uh, Filling in for Mary Jo Foley is her stunt double, Mary Jo Foley of AllAboutMicrosoft.com. How are you? Good. I'm in the green room, as you can tell today. Okay. It's, it's like nature out there. That's you look like you're is. on a porch in North Carolina or something. I'm, I'm, I am on a porch in Massachusetts today at my Mass mom's. Wait, what? <laughs> what part of Massachusetts? I, I'm right across from your house, Paul. I didn't want to tell you, but... <laughs> it's just easier to set it up that way. Otherwise, we have to set up two different cameras in the same space. Make sure the microphones are familiar. familiar. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, so we have we have Mary Jo in Massachusetts, and then we have uh, Motorola and Microsoft and I ITC. So, I mean, they're, they're having a fun time there. The ITC, let's go to our top story here. ITC is saying that Motorola mobility violates one out of seven of, Motor of Microsoft's patents, that is. Uh, apparently... Microsoft wanted to get some jabs in before Motorola is f fully bought by Google. Uh, what does this mean? It means people oh, are going to be paying money. Where do we even begin on this one? <laughs> I know. This is one of those things that's like, okay, do we want to go back to the beginning, October 2010, when this whole battle between these two started? And Microsoft sued Motorola over um, not complying with, well, well, allegedly infringing, I should say, on Android patents, the whole Android patents thing again, you know, mm -hmm. are they infringing on Microsoft patents? Then um, added a second lawsuit in November, then Mo Motorola countersued Microsoft, and now it's in the ITC's hands. And so this is just a preliminary ruling that came out this week. Um, and the finding was out of the seven patents that are still left in the case that uh, Motorola is in violation of one but on four counts, if you're following all this, all these numbers. Yeah, four <laughs> claims of that one patent, because patents can have multiple yeah. claims. Now, the thing yes. is, is, Motorola has said, I think, that they have a workaround already. This isn't that important. We can fix it. Uh, do, do you guys buy that? I mean, that's what everyone seems, that seems to be everyone's response these, these days. I think HTC said something well, similar when Apple uh, uh, was founded. Their, their patents were held up by uh, the ITC. So, does, is it, if it's that easy to make workarounds, um, <laughs> why didn't they do that in the first place? Yeah. Well, I mean, first you want to see what happens, right? I mean, uh, most of the companies that Microsoft has approached, you know, much as a mafia don would approach you in a huge stretch limo, have just simply <laughs> give them, given them a bag of cash. You know, so there are a couple of holdouts, and uh, Motorola is one of them. Uh, I, we know Barnes & Noble is one of the other ones. And what am I missing? Well, at least one other major uh, player is missing in there. But, you know, most of the big Android vendors have cross-licensed uh, technology patents with Microsoft. So Motorola decided they would try their hand at court. And, you know, the thing about this kind of lawsuit is you only really have to win once, right? I mean, that's the, that's the deal. So it sets a precedent, and I think that's the big deal here, because if they are violating this, it probably means that every single 
uh, Android device on Earth is violating it, and thus those companies are violating it as well. And so Motorola so, tried their hand and got their thumbs broke, what are you saying? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Microsoft's saying there are 18 devices that um, include code from this one patent, including mm -hmm. the Droid, the Droid 2. Um, there's a yep. whole list of them. Pro the Bravo, the Charm, Charm, the Click. I mean, you name it. That's It's on the list. The Zoom list. tablet and is in there. Um, the Droid X that I have is in there. Yeah. This is, this is the patent yep. that's revolved around uh, ActiveSync, or is this a different patent? No. This is, this, oh, I thought this was an active sync. No, is it? Let me oh, see. Well, this is, this is scheduling meetings from a mobile device, pat, okay. also known as yeah, Patent yeah, 566, yeah. It, for all those who are really into this. Yeah, if you're keeping... These okay. things, it, it, if you think about uh, the million things that any modern smartphone can do, right, every little action you can take is patented somewhere, you know? So if you tap a phone number that's embedded in an email and that thing appears as a link and then the phone dials that number or lets you do something else with that, somebody owns the patent to that, you know? And, and this is the problem and, 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 and the reason that so many of these companies have simply just decided to cross-license each other's technology because in most cases, it's just too hard to figure out, um, you know, who owns what and, and they're all violating someone's patents. I mean, they almost have to be, you know, that's the nature of the beast. So the simplest thing to do is to make sure if you're making a phone, to use Windows Phone as your operating system. And Thank you. I'm going to say it like, quite like that, but yes. <laughs> like we see Windows Phone is fully indemnified <laughs> by Microsoft. Surprisingly, yeah, if you right, don't want to get sued, it's the way. Yeah, use one of these. These are the snazzy. This is the Motorola. Uh, what is it? The 800 Lumi 800, which is 90 way, that better. Might be, that might be one of the lamest lock screen photos I've ever seen in my life. You I just wanted. <laughs> you wanted to trash Tony Wang this morning, and you succeeded. <laughs> uh, yeah. So look at that. Look at the tile interface and. Patented, well, no, but, but think about it this way. You know, when, when you license Android as a handset maker, you know, your, your Motorola before Google buys them or your HTC or Samsung or whatever, you know, you pay nothing for that. Sorry, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, th that's the old adage, you know, you get what you pay for because Google is not going to indemnify you either. So when Microsoft or Apple or whoever else comes to sue you because you're violating their patents, you're on your own. You know, you have to defend yourself against that or not. So, you know, most companies so far, again, have taken the path of least resistance and uh, simply cross-license. You know, so Motorola didn't, and, and we'll see. I mean, uh, my expectation is that, like Mary Jo said, this is a, a preliminary ruling, but I would expect that the ITC will come back and say, look, you're going to have to pull these devices from the market unless you make a change that we deem acceptable. And then they'll be given till next September or October to make that change, and they will. And half the stuff that is affected by this won't even be sold by that point anyway, so they can make these changes going forward. But again, the, the important bit for Microsoft is that they did win on one count, and that means they have this precedent, and now they can go after. Yeah, they have deals with lots of different companies already. I think, uh, is it HTC, the $15 uh, an Android device? Is that them, or is that some other manufacturer? Well, that's, this, that's the guess. That's but the yeah. guess. There's them, there's Samsung. They have deals with, like, almost every Android manufacturer out there, which is um, actually not that surprising, considering, I mean, it, it, all these guys, this, this always drives me nuts. People will complain. They go, oh, look, Microsoft has patents. Well, you know, these other companies could have done that, too. You know, it's kind of a crazy idea. Well, if Google's I, behind Android. They could have. You got to, you know, people get so weird about patents. Uh, you, I think I just you got to remind people. Maybe maybe it's just because I create stuff and and uh, and I've I've been ripped off. You know I've seen people republish my articles on their own websites, so word for word. You know I've seen this kind of thing. You know when you create something and you own it and you make it, or they're a business, so I mean, it, it, they buy a company that owns a thing. I mean that that's that's an asset. That's something you have to protect. Um, it's completely understandable. It's not just understandable. It's expected. You know it's a publicly owned company. This is a their their uh, responsibility is to protect this stuff. I mean, people get so, you know, if we didn't have mobile industry patents, then, you know, uh, the industry would be such a better place, you know. Um, no, not necessarily. I don't, I, not necessarily. And protecting your stuff is what Microsoft did in the beginning. I was reading, I was reading a, a book, and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this whole homebrew club stuff and, and Microsoft or Bill Gates penning a letter saying, stop stealing our stuff. I mean, there, sure. this, is, this is a pretty good track history for the company from the beginning. It's we want to get paid for stuff we make. I know it's a wacky I know, idea. Uh, I, it's wacky. <laughs> I know. This is insane. Seriously. You spend hours and hours coding something. You come up with the process or you come up with something you can be protected on and then you use it? You believe that? <laughs> I know. Yeah. I think, I think you know, the, the interesting thing for me in, in this week's coverage of this case was, 
you know, I saw a lot of people saying, oh, it's interesting. Both sides say they won this week. So, you know, yes. um, yep. Motorola was out there going, hey, they only got us on one of seven patents. And Microsoft's <laughs> yeah. like, ha, huh, we got them on one of seven patents. You know, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, you know, I think Motorola's in more trouble on this than Microsoft is because they got them on one patent. And it's a pretty it's a pretty central patent to the way things work on mobile devices. Um, yes. So, so you know, what ha what happens next now is um, they ha the uh, ITC has till, I think, April 2012 to come to its final ruling. Then there's a 60-day review period. And then even the president, uh, President Obama, is going to have to review the decision, I guess, in the end. That's what Motorola said. Um, so, yeah. There, there's still a lot of steps to go, but I don't think either side can complain can claim a complete victory. But if I were Motorola, I think I'd be more worried at this point than Microsoft. Yeah, on the practical side, this usually doesn't impact the handsets. Like, if there's going to be a ban on the handsets, that probably won't happen until this thing is completely finished. And that's if Microsoft de decides to not have a deal with Motorola, which is really what they want. It's always like, hey, give us a revenue stream. We like money. I know it's a crazy, another crazy idea that businesses yeah. do. They like getting revenue streams. So I don't think it's going it, to, I think you're going to still see Motorola phones even after Google buys them. And I'm sure Google's got some patents or, or some interesting technology that Google, uh, Microsoft would like to have and say, hey, you know that patent we have on this thing? We can work a deal out. Cross I don't know about that. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that Motorola does. And then, well, then yeah, of course, Google will have Motorola eventually. Yeah. One day. I mean, since I think 99% of the shareholders said fine, and the EC is holding it up still for some reason. I'm other. trying to think of a, an example that would make sense to people, you know, but there's, could be, there isn't really because, you know, it's like, you know, that story like Google walks in your house and steals your TV, and then you come back and you say, look, you stole my TV. And they said, no, no, I didn't steal your TV. Look, I bought a warranty after the fact. It's all said. I own the TV now, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the thing, you know, Google for years has been using these uh, mobile industry technologies that are owned by other companies and then giving away the product that they made with it, and, and thus they are somehow not culpable for this. I mean, it's amazing to me that this situation can exist, but, you know, there it is. So uh, hopefully if they get Motorola and they get those patents and they can enter into cross-licensing agreements with other companies, or uh, as may be the case with Google, they just decide to use it as kind of a nuclear option, um, whatever. But I, I just wish they had done this up front, you know, done the right thing up front uh, with this type of stuff. Because as far as I'm concerned, all I did was copy a bunch of stuff that other people did, and then they gave it away for free. And I don't quite understand why that's okay. This always feels yeah. like the end scene of Reservoir Dogs to me. Everyone's got like a gun pointing at each other. <laughs> and Motorola, Google's got Motorola's back. You know, they're waiting. They're waiting. And, Mo yeah. and Microsoft's got a gun to both of them. So it, it, it's, it's, this is so much fun. Um, so. I, I mean, the, the really fun part of this, when these are actually coming to trial now, is actually getting to see what these patents are because we yeah. we haven't known up to this point. You know, everybody's been saying, "Oh, Microsoft owns some patents that infringe that Android infringes on," but nobody really knew. So which ones? You know, and now right. we're starting to actually see. And you, which and you see how silly some of them are too. Yeah. You know? Yep. Like I said, they're for every little action you can possibly imagine, you know, Apple uh, won, and I, I, you know, put the air quotes around that, a, a, a similar case against HTC. And um, in this case, they, they were found liable on uh, one of four patents. So again, you know, HTC in some ways could also claim victory, I suppose. But the Apple patent, let me see if I can find this, was a particularly, uh, a similarly small kind of a thing. And let's see, it is da -da -da -da, something to do with... This might have been the one where you uh, press on a phone number and it, it allows you to do other actions like, um, you know, add that phone number to an existing contact or I think that's what this one might have been. Um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's the type of thing where you expect this stuff to be in phones. And so it's kind of confusing that this would be the argument, you know, but that's the problem because HTC apparently never did enter into a cross licensing agreement with Apple. Although I don't seem to remember Apple opening the barn doors for that kind of thing either, but. I think what Apple wants is for no one to use this stuff. They don't want to get paid for other people to use it. They just want to keep it for themselves, which, you know, again, I suppose is they're right. They can do what they want, you know, with their, if they own it, they, I suppose. Um, but yeah, but, it, but this case opens up uh, information about what those things are that they patented. And then you can look at them and say, uh, geez, isn't there prior use for a lot of this stuff? I mean, it's amazing what gets through the patent system as well, which again is uh, also one of the big complaints about this whole thing. Yeah, the system's not exactly uh, funded well. 
And you have some overworked <laughs> people out there going, yeah, that's good. To stamp this, stamp that, stamp this. So, I mean, when people freak out yeah. about why did that get approved? So, uh, like th this year, someone will get the email, pa uh, the patent on email. You know, like I just invented email. <laughs> you know, and then they can start suing people, you know, for a message of electronically delivering messages or mail, uh, you know, <laughs> over a network or something. You're like, you know, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, it seems like it's just going to devolve into, if you don't want to pay the, the actual royalties, it just devolves into chaos. We can't have meetings and we can't talk on a phone. We're going to have to yeah. meet each other in person. It's a crazy idea. I know, I know. Face-to-face -face yeah. communications where like, let's write this down on a piece of paper. Unless I'm going <laughs> to patent that, which I don't think you can. Uh, so, before people freak out in the chat room, I'm just kidding. I don't know. U.S. patent and trade off? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Should we move on to happier Redmond rumors? The idea that Microsoft and Nokia apparently were going to. There's rumors coming out of the Wall Street Journal. Their sources say yeah. that uh, Microsoft and Nokia were looking into jointly buying RIM. You know, RIM. Yeah, those those if guys. You could, if you could pick like, the one thing that would be dumber for Microsoft to buy than Yahoo, like, what would you pick? <laughs> Maybe RIM. The danger. Maybe RIM. <laughs> so. <laughs> Danger. Yeah. Wow. Well. <laughs> we, we talk about this on, Settle on down over almost <laughs> every Windows Weekly now, right? Yeah. We, we talk about how, how the original source of a story, you read it, and then you see the headlines that come after it and how convoluted they are, right? Like I saw right. a thing saying, Microsoft and Nokia about to buy RIM, or they yes. were seri in serious talks to buy RIM. Here's the exact sentence from the Wall Street Journal. Microsoft and Nokia in recent months flirted with the idea of making a joint <laughs> bid. I right. mean, that could just be like two guys in a room going, hey, exactly. wouldn't it be funny if we bought RIM? Yeah, huh? Hey, Mary that would Joe, be hilarious. Paul, do you want to buy RIM? Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah I do. That would be hilarious. Now, right what now. do you want it for dinner? And then they'd never talk about it again. Right. We're flirting with the idea, though. But did you see that RIM's, like, their, their stock stock price actually spiked on rumors? Of I mean, course, of course Amazon's, because Amazon was looked, there was a rumor about that, too. Reuters said that Amazon was going to buy RIM, and they actually had serious talks. And that spiked yeah. the stock price. And then well, look, this came I, out. I, I think the, the, the people, you know, you overreact to things. I don't mean you personally. I mean, w one I overreacts to things. Um, but I think Microsoft just is, again, is a sort of a financial responsibility. Knowing that RIM is potentially going out of business is obviously doing a horrible job. Would speak to investors and to its shareholders or you know, its board of directors or whatever and say, does any of this make sense? Right. We should at least think about it. Yep. And then the diligence. answer, maybe the answer, right? The answer could come back and say no. You know, Amazon is busy right now getting into the mobile space. Would it make sense for us as Amazon to own a platform that would be on these devices that we sell? Maybe we should look into this. So, th this it's not surprising that these companies would look at this. What would be surprising is if we woke up tomorrow and the, and the headline said Microsoft is buying RIM. See, that would be. That would be the sign of mental illness at the top there. But <laughs> the, the, the fact that they were looking at it is not only not surprising, it's the responsible thing to do. Well, I'm they just remembering when, when Google bought Motorola Mobility, or at least they were planning, their, or they announced their intentions to buy it. When I saw that right. headline in the morning, I'm like, wait, what? What just happened? Google just bought a Motorola Mobility? How did that happen? So, like, I, I, I can imagine a world where we see Microsoft going into this. But well, should, should we play? Imagine, um, Go ahead. Imagine a world where Microsoft bought Motorola Mobility. And you said, wait, what? Why would they buy Motorola Mobility? And then the answer was, because Google wanted it. And, yeah. and from a competitive standpoint, it might actually make sense for Microsoft to buy Motorola just to prevent Google from getting it. Just like it might make sense, it might, it probably doesn't, but it might make sense for Microsoft and Nokia to buy RIM to get those mobile industry patents that RIM no doubt owns to, and phase out that product line Get those people moved over to Windows Phone as much of them as they can just to prevent it from falling into the hands of someone else. Like that might actually be reason enough. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as, you know, people thinking this means um, Microsoft and Nokia were somehow now going to start making handsets. I know, um, based on uh, BlackBerry, jump, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, wait, hold on now. <laughs> they don't have to do that if they buy RIM, if, or even if Microsoft bought Nokia, right? If they, I mean, there's a lot of different things they could do. They could just buy a company for the patents, you know? I mean, so, you know, just to see the mental leaps of faith that have happened because of this rumor this week has been kind of astounding, I would say. Well, in all fairness, it is, it is a slow time. 
for tech it news. Is. So, I mean, it could be like, okay, what could, yeah. in, in a perfect world, if this did happen, what could possibly, what could Microsoft do with this? And what would Nokia do with this? Because I remember when we were talking about the idea of, of uh, Windows Phone coming to Nokia. I mean, that was a strange idea too. Because I mean, uh, even though when Stephen Elop was installed, it's like, ah, it seems like a no-brainer. But uh, there's also still rumors of Microsoft buying Nokia's smartphone business, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But it, the, the idea that Microsoft and Nokia would join up, buy RIM, and I was thinking Microsoft would probably get on the enterprise side, take care of the software that way. So they're like, okay, exchange of BlackBerry stuff, everything works together. We got this. And then... Yeah, put it then, right into the... Right, exactly. And then, and give and it then, away. They would give it away because that's what they... Well, they would... I'm sorry. They would sell exchange. But they would... That technology would become part of exchange. It wouldn't be a separate thing like it is today. And BlackBerry yeah. security is like, is like legendary to this point. And that's why people keep using it for their communications with business. Mm -hmm. So that seems like, okay, put that right into, into Microsoft's hands and they, they'd love that. And Nokia could just have the deals to, to have you know, factory the deals. More, the more we talk about this, the more I think they should buy RIM now. This is a great idea. <laughs> I mean, what else, gonna, what else is RIM going to do? That's the, well, the thing is, you know, what, what is RIM going to do? I mean, they don't seem to... Um, what, is the, what are they going to do? I don't know. What's the, what is this, the sound that a toilet flight makes when you flush it? it I, they're going to spiral slowly and disappear is what they're going to do. Oh, that's not fair. It's, Somebody has to buy... That, it didn't I, happen not to fair. I don't, I'm just, that's what's going to happen. I mean, have you, it, unless those two CEOs are hit by a bus or decide to step down, which they show no intention of doing, that company is going nowhere. They have no idea what they're doing. See, Amazon was rumored to buy them. I think Amazon's actually a better fit. What, what do you guys me think? Me too. Yep, I yeah, do too. Yeah. Like that one didn't like go make me go, oh, really? I was like, oh, yeah, huh, that <laughs> actually kind of makes a little sense. <laughs> well, because arguably they need a platform, you know. The, the one thing that made sense when HP bought WebOS, the one thing, you know, maybe the only thing that made sense there was they were making a stab at controlling their own destiny. And that makes sense to me. You know, that they would want to follow what we now think of as the Apple model, not that Apple pioneered this, but that they would control the whole widget, you know, including the operating system. Right now, HP makes hardware and they integrate software, but they integrate it with software that other people make, like usually from Microsoft. And it would be understandable that that company would want to control its own destiny and actually control the software, software stack as well. So in the same way... I could picture and have, uh, we talked about this last year in the, or this past year in the context of WebOS. It makes sense to me that Amazon would want to control that aspect of its devices as well. Because right now, it's relying on a company that in many ways it is competing with, right? Google with the Android. So Google gives away Android so they can use it, but maybe that's not always the case. Maybe uh, things change there. I mean, that's kind of a tenuous situation for them in some ways. Yeah, that and considering they, uh, Amazon has actually worked on that modified version of Android and the QNX operating system for RIM can actually run Android apps. It didn't seem like that far of a leap. They've already done the software engineering. Wouldn't be that difficult to go over to QNX if they own that outright because it just, I mean, you can do Android player, I guess, effectively and skin it like crazy. And I, I think it would work. Um, but uh, I guess isn't the Kindle Fire really just a playbook? It's from too? the same manufacturer, same OEM. Right. It's Quanta. But it's physically right, a little careful, different. Careful, careful, careful. I know. I, I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a bit, yeah. perhaps, yeah. like using the word flirted with fine. <laughs> um. Are they essentially well, the same? Yes. You know, the, the first Zoom device was basically a Toshiba whatever, and Toshiba sold a... Uh, a media player of their own at the time that was actually the same exact hardware that was the Zune, but the Zune had custom Microsoft software on top of it, of course. I remember so, that I mean, this, this is the, ugly the, one. Yeah, the point being, uh, th this is not unprecedented, of course. And, and when you think about Android devices, it, it shouldn't be surprising that two Android based tablets would be very similar or even identical under the covers. Um, you know, yeah. that's the nature of that business. Um, it's a sad thing because I, I got to play with the playbook for an extended amount of time. It actually has really good hardware. It's, there's just nothing to run on it, though. That's this, <laughs> don't, just don't a small problem. Um, there's a, I'm, the sure they'll fix it, right? I'm sure they'll fix it very quickly, though. So. Oh, yeah, it's only that? been like how many years? They just got Angry Birds. So, I mean, they're Actually, they're I was going to say, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking for a way to rip into Windows Phone right now, here's something for you to ponder for a moment. Let's do it. You can, <laughs> you can now get every single Angry Birds game on the playbook. As of this week, and we still only have the first Angry, Angry Birds on Windows Phone. But you got it before the playbook. How so, no, we only got the first one, you but now they have all of them. Well, I, well, let me think about that. I don't know if that's still <laughs> fair to rip into Windows Phone there, because they actually have other apps. Yeah, they have other apps, I get it. I'm just saying, you know, if Angry Birds is your metric, well, then the, 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 Nook, the Nook beats up the, the Windows Phone then. 
Sure. It's, it's Can I make phone calls? Though? Can I make phone calls? Do you make who makes phone calls? <laughs> <laughs> Such a silly. This, this, is, one. this is what's <laughs> Apple's dominance has has trained us not to think that these things can make phone calls properly. Mm -hmm. This is what happens. I, well, I like having a computer in my pocket. I didn't make calls on my computer either. I don't like. That. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, let, let's talk about. Uh, I think this is the uh, "We Told You So" segment from Windows Weekly. Uh, wow. Microsoft pulling out of CES 2013. At least they won't have a major presence. What a fun series of blog posts this was. From the official Microsoft blog was, I think it was, um, what's the fellow's name? I forgot the guy's name. Frank, but, uh, Frank Shaw. Thank you. Frank Shaw sure. writing that Microsoft will no longer have a major presence at CES. After 2012, no more keynotes, no more booth, that giant booth next to the Intel booth in Central Hall. And then CEA writing their own post saying, well, we wish Microsoft well, but, uh, you know, we have a long waiting list for that booth, so we'll see you when we see you. And uh, then they were playing that song, you know, Ain't Missing You at All. Uh, <laughs> what you, what is that a song? It is, actually. It's an old Don't go away. Song. Don't go away, Matt. Just go away. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But there's all these rumors about what actually took place. What happened? Yeah, they're Why all, did they're this... all they're, those, are, those are all bogus, though. So. Okay. So could you explain what the rumors are before we, we debunk them? No, let's just debunk them and move on. No, <laughs> <laughs> no so let's, let me say first, yep. because we this was pretty cool. We mentioned this on Windows Weekly on Rumor of the Week. I think it was two weeks ago. We had Microsoft pulls out of CES 2013. And then boom, hey, look what happened. Microsoft pulled out of CES 2013. Um, so then the rumors started up. Okay, they didn't really pull out. We kicked them out, the CEA officials said, you know, supposedly. Somebody who was unnamed. Then Microsoft's like, uh, yeah, huh? We, I don't think we got kicked out. We left on a, of our own accord. You know, then it was the back and forth. And then this morning I saw The Verge, who happens to be a very close partner on CES 2012, uh, some, got more of an official comment. And it sounded like from the latest uh, back and forth that the CEA officials were about to up the prices for how much it would cost to have the first kickoff keynote. And Microsoft was like, you know what? We don't really want to pay the higher price. And we've been doing this for 14 years. So it's a good time for us to walk since we were thinking about walking anyways. So that's, that's the latest version of all the back and forth that I've read on this. We should also point out that both Mary, Joe, and I have uh, pulled out of CS well before Microsoft. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> Did know. they kick you out? Did they say there's a wait list of people no, waiting no. to get in? Look, to get you guys? are always messy, but I think it's important to remember in this case that or it's important to know, I would say, most people probably don't know this. You know, Microsoft pays to be there, of course, on the show floor. There's a fee for that. But they also pay for that keynote spot. And for some reason, they've had this opening keynote. I, it never made sense to me that Microsoft was the opening keynote of CS. It, it, there's not a, a big consumer electronics company with a rare exception. You know, obviously, the Xbox is a big deal. But um, it just didn't seem like a good match. And CES, as I'm sure we talked about a couple of weeks ago, has always been at the wrong time of the year for what it is. I mean, the holiday season has just ended. Here's what we're going to be selling at the next holiday season nine months from now. And then God help you if they show something really interesting and you can't get your hands on it for months, which is often the case, almost always the case, um, especially with the Microsoft stuff, because they would show off. Um, I remember the big, the big one that got me was Freestyle, which became Windows Media Center. Uh, they showed off in January 2002. And uh, it was very exciting, you know, much like Windows 8 is today. Um, they didn't know how they were going to sell it. They didn't know when they were going to sell it. They just know it was coming later in the year. It was like, you know, I said to the guy at the time, um, thank you for showing me the future. Everything I use today sucks. Thanks for that. Um, you know, and it was terrible because now you had to wait uh, before you could uh, use that stuff. So CES, you know, whatever. I mean, I, CES is such a mess. I'm I'm, I'm I'm happy to have one less reason to feel bad about not going to CES, I guess. Now, when you think and Microsoft, do you think consumer electronics? Do you think, oh, I'm thinking about the Sidewinder. I'm thinking of a Microsoft mouse. I'm thinking of something I can buy from Microsoft other than the Xbox. And the Xbox is like one of the few exceptions. Mm -hmm. they, they make software. And so you can see yeah. Microsoft software on like in Samsung's booth. You could see it in, in LG's booth. You can see it in any of these tablet manufacturers or the Ultrabook makers you're going to see them. And actually, you know, Microsoft can have a presence sort of at CES. You know, they have those shows like Showstoppers and Digital Experience. You know, Microsoft could have a very big presence at those shows. And that's where the press goes anyway. And that's where they're going to get coverage. And that's where you need to see those live hands-on things where, you know, people walk around with the cameras and everything. I mean, um, that's where that stuff's going to happen. So 
No, no big loss. I don't know. The the part of the whole rumor thing that really got to me this week, though, was was people saying, you know, um, Microsoft, they wanted to kick Microsoft out of the league keynote because somebody better wanted to take that spot. And I'm like, um, like who? Um, me. Meg Whitman from HP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, who's like, yeah, the, guy, the, the guys from Yahoo uh, had some stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, do they think Facebook is going to jump in or like, um, I don't know, Twitter? It's like, that's not yeah. their show either. Right. I mean, uh, somebody said to me, I'm sure they get kicked out. I'm like, yeah, because um, they have other big keynotes like Xerox. <laughs> um, exactly. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, uh, there, it's not like something that was a super hot commodity anyways to me, like being the opening keynote yeah. at CES. Yeah, I, I mean, just, Apple wasn't going to take it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates' keynotes where he'd show off all these future technologies that this is the only place you would see it. I mean, there wasn't YouTube and stuff back then. You couldn't just access it easily now. I mean, like, if if uh, if if Bill Gates could introduce the tablet PC or show off like Surface concepts and things like that um, via the web, he probably would have. Because then you have a controlled well, experience. Remember too. I mean, until uh, a week or two ago, we were talking about CES was the next milestone for Windows 8. It always was, and it's kind of an artificial thing, right? We know what's on the schedule. We know it's something that Microsoft goes to every year. We know it's the place where they talk about consumer stuff for Windows. Thus, that will be the place. But, you know, CS wasn't really on the schedule for Microsoft with Windows 8 this year. And, and I think that might have been part of the poll here where they said, look, you know, this thing is going to take X number of months to happen. It can't happen for January. So what are we going to do? We're going to do that thing that Steven Sanofsky hates to do, which is like show something that's not finished. But he wants to show it when it's ready to go, right? So uh, this, I think this was the kind of the, the, the pull in either directions that, you know, CS had for Microsoft, just like, Macworld did for Apple, you know, before it, where it just didn't align with the company's own internal schedules, and it just didn't make sense. I'm going to say conspiracy theory. Uh, Microsoft didn't want Steve Ballmer speaking publicly live very much, um, so that that way they can control the message. Because sometimes <laughs> yeah. he, he, says, he says stuff like, this is going to come out in three months, you'll see it, you'll love it, and then it never happens. I can't think of a single time where that man ever stood on a stage, held up a tablet, and promised you'd be able to buy it in a few months. So never seen that, that with HP Slate that didn't come out for, <laughs> other than Enterprise. Never saw I think that. He actually, did, he actually did that two years in a row, by the way. But um, <laughs> he was actually a better, or is a better speaker than Bill Gates ever was. I mean, he, he doesn't have the famous name, I guess. Um, but he's actually... He's, he's got, got the infamous better, name at this point, I think. <laughs> Bill Gates yeah, has the better, famous one. Better stage presence, you know. <laughs> I, I CES never made sense for Microsoft, so it's okay. But that said, they are going to be at CES in another month. Mm -hmm. And Paul, I'm, I'd I'd like to hear Paul's picks. What do you think they're going to show now, Paul? Because I don't think they're going to show a lot. I mean, I, I'm guessing they're going to show. Um, they'll probably show off Windows 8 beta or a pre-beta, just in a very vague way. I bet. And then there's going to be a Nokia announcement um, on the same day that Steve Ballmer is keynoting. Um, so I'm but sure they'll have phone news. But that, that in itself kind of stinks because the way Windows Phone has gone, and again, only for a couple of years, is there's an event in February for Windows Phone. So if you want to find out about the next version of Windows Phone, I would bet pretty heavily that news is going to come in February at Mobile World Congress, not January at CES, and that the Nokia event will be very specifically around what they're going to release in the United States, whatever that is. We know about the T-Mobile phone, but um, you know that phone there, or the next-gen version of that, the, the Lumia A900 or whatever they're calling that phone. I think what we're going to find out about is Nokia, Windows 7.5, not Windows Phone 7.5, yeah. not Windows Phone 8 or whatever. I, I think that happens at Mobile World Congress. And that's... Yeah. That's another good example of how CES just doesn't line up with their plans. You know, they'll have to show off Windows 8 in some capacity. Are they going to, you know, divulge something new at the show? I mean, uh, above and beyond what they're divulging every week on the blog. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I I don't expect a lot now. Mary jo, I could what do you see them doing. Uh, I, I could see them doing Connect for Windows. The, you know, the new hardware that they say they have coming, like uh, they, okay. they're going to have a yep. version of the Kinect sensor that works at closer range. That would be a good show to Facial, show that. Facial uh, recognition to... type of thing. Yep. 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 Um, and I, I, th I agree with Paul. I don't think it's going to be a big Windows phone reveal. Like I've seen a lot of people speculating that they're going to talk about Apollo at CES, which is I just don't see the, it. 
No, me neither. The big version of Windows Phone that's probably not till fall of this of 2012. I, I don't think that's what they're going to show. I agree. I think it's going to be an announcement about when you're going to get your first Nokia handsets on U.S. carriers and maybe show you like the Nokia 900, which would be the U.S. version of the 800, something like that. Yeah, I, I think the the Connect will probably be the biggest thing they could show. The biggest possible thing that they could show, and this is just wide wide eye speculation. It's not based on anything, just kind of based on how things have been going recently. What we've been talking about, it, I think it would be amazing for Microsoft to show off or discuss uh, Office on iOS and Android. I think it would be amazing. I think that would be an earth shattering news story, even if it wasn't ready to go. I don't think I we're going to see that at CES. <laughs> I don't either. I'm just, yeah, I don't, I don't either. That would be earth shattering, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're trying to there. dampen expectations. That's uh, that's my feeling right now. Unless they're it was dampening. there, unless it was, you know, partially ready to go or whatever. But, yeah. yeah. Or their booth will say, like, see you at WinHack or Build or Mix. That's all I'll say. <laughs> or Thank you for naming con yeah, the conventions that don't exist anymore. But yes, uh, <laughs> yes, we'll, <laughs> it, we'll see you at one of those things. I think it resurrects one of these things. They got time. I wish they would. They don't have to bother. They have that booth. They got to use it for something. That's <laughs> true. Uh, let's let's take this uh, this moment to thank a sponsor, Ford. Uh, this episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by uh, Ford. Available featuring available Sync. Now, some of the some of the folks at Twit got to try out Sync for a test drive, and uh, there's a little known person, uh, Leo Laporte. He got to try it out. Uh, let, let's check it out. What he thought of it. Hey everybody, Leo Laporte. I thought we'd take a, a little ride. We've been talking about the. Ford Sync and my Ford Touch for so long, and I've never actually shown you how it works. You know, Ford sent down this new 2012 Ford Focus, not mine to keep, alas, but I would like to show you, as long as I've got it, a little bit about the nav and the services and the app link and all the cool things. Let's get inside and I'll give you a tour of the 2012 Ford Focus. We're gonna, I'm just gonna go for a little ride. Look, see this button? Watch, I got my foot on the brake, you press the button. It's a fob, keyless. Car starts up. Oh, here we go. I like this too. When the screen comes on, it says, "Hello, good morning. You're arriving. You're driving a Ford." All right, let's go here. Yeah, this is nice. This is sweet. Hands on the wheel, eyes on the road. That's the whole idea behind Sync and My Ford Touch. But you hit this paddle right here, and you can do anything. So one of the nice things, of course, uh, about Sync and My Ford Touch is I can connect to a cell phone. I've got my uh, iPhone hooked up here. But not just as a phone, I can make calls with it, of course, but can I, I can also uh, use it as a media device. So watch, I'll play a song here. Please say a command. Audio. Audio, say a command. Play artist Steely Dan. Playing artist Steely Dan. And now without doing anything, I've picked an artist. I can do the same thing with podcasts, books on tape or audiobooks, anything that's on my devices, I can play. I can even say, let's play the radio. The idea is you can do anything you want with this. Uh, you've got a whole media hub. So if you've got a Nano, the kid's Nano, if you've got a phone via USB or Bluetooth, uh, you just talk to it and tell it what you want to hear. Let, let's give it a try here. This is while I'm driving. USB. USB. Play artist Steely Dan. Now that's cool, isn't it? It's little things like that to just make it a pleasure to drive a Ford. And that is the that is the I think it was the Ford was it Focus or Focus? Not to be mixed up. See, I should focus. It's the Ford Focus. And we thank Ford for their support of Windows Weekly. So try it out if you can. Let's go on to enterprise stuff. I think it's I think Hadoop is next up on the lineup, but I've moved. How did this get so high on the list? Oh, I, I tinkered with the lineup. <laughs> <laughs> the lineup has been tinkered with. Yes, it has. But, okay, can I just say, like we've been saying earlier on the show, this has been a quiet news week, except for this. This to me was like, I couldn't believe this dropped in the middle of a holiday week because it's a really big deal for all our enterprise fans, at least. Okay, so what dropped? Uh, okay, so... Um, you know, Microsoft had said that they they were working with Hortonworks on doing two distributions of Hadoop, the uh, the big data uh, framework that's going to run on top of Windows. So there's going to be an Azure one. There's going to be a Windows uh, a Windows Server one and an Azure one, right? So 
Um, that's what we knew, but we didn't really know much else about this. And Microsoft had been very vague about the details. Well, they published a, a very short 11 minute video to channel nine that when I watched it, I was like, okay, here's all the details that everybody has been asking for about this project in 11 minutes. Um, so now we have the, the time frame on it. We know that um, the general availability of Hadoop on Windows Azure is going to be March 2012. We know general availability on the server version is going to be in June 2012. And whenever you asked Microsoft before about these dates, they wouldn't tell you. Um, and what was really interesting to me is what they're doing on the um, Windows Server version. Uh, so they're actually integrating Hadoop with Active Directory. Um, so this this is a really big deal because you know if whenever you integrate something into Active Directory, it, it gives you the single sign-on capability. So Microsoft's going to be um, marketing this as we're going to give you single sign-on capability for um, big data analytics using Hadoop on Windows Azure. And so, you know, they've never really found, an, to me at least, a way to integrate their cloud and their on-premises server and their big data stories. It felt like three different stories going on at Microsoft with nothing really in common. Um, but now, I, after watching this video and, and learning a little more about this, I'm like, this is what they're gonna do. They're gonna make the big data uh, strategy and different pieces that they have integrate with what they already have in the form of Excel, Power Pivot, and all these data analytics tools. So it, I, I, it really made me kind of go, aha. It was like one of these aha moments, you know, like, hey, here's how they think they're gonna make money off of this Hadoop thing on Azure and Windows Server. So I, I'm advising anybody who cares about Hadoop um, and Microsoft's Cloud, go watch this video on Channel 9. I have a link to it on my blog and it, that once you watch this, you'll be like, ah, oh, now I see where they're going to go with this. And the question is, you know, will this help Microsoft sell more Windows Azure? Because they've been selling a lot of Office 365, you know, which is their platform on a service strategy uh, offering, but they really haven't been selling a lot of Azure. And you can tell because they never release numbers of how many people have bought Azure. Um, so this, I think, is their way of kind of backing into selling Windows Azure and hoping that they can tie in the whole analytics component, not just for people who are scientists, but for any kind of developer uh, and any user too, who might care about using tools they already have today, like Excel and Power Pivot to get at big data stored in Hadoop on, on Windows Server or on Windows Azure. Paul, do, so you, that's do you share the same amount of enthusiasm as Mary Jo on this particular piece of news? Not quite the same. <laughs> <laughs> not, not quite but the same. But he's not asleep. That's good. He's not sleeping. <laughs> you sound very excited about this. You think this is good news for Microsoft? You think this is going to this is going to bring him bring him uh, like who's their main competitor in this in this market right now? I think Hadoop is actually a competitor of something that Google made. Um, yeah. Well, uh, the Apache Hadoop is an open source implementation, and so different companies have done their own implementations of Hadoop. And you know, before this, Microsoft was really planning to do their own also, and it was called Dryad, and it was something that was going to compete with Hadoop, basically. Um, but the, I, somebody inside has convinced them, like, hey, you know, everybody in the world who's who's caring about big data right now wants a Hadoop implementation, so let's do one for Windows, and then we're going to have a more compelling offering for people who already know things like Excel and SQL data services and those kind of things, and give them a way to actually get at um, all this data, all these different data sets that people are storing in the cloud now and storing on servers. And that'll make them say, hey, you know what, I know Excel, let me try using Excel as my way into analyzing this big data. So I, I, I kind of feel like it's their way of, of almost equalizing, or as they said in, in one of the posts I read, democratizing who can take advantage of big data sets in, in the near term. That's why I think it's a big deal. So you heard it there. That's a big deal. I'm, I'm <laughs> speechless with that one. Um, <laughs> gotta go. uh, unless there's anything else, I'm going to move on to the, uh, the picture password. Anybody? Alex? Well, I, <laughs> so, Audience? Uh, uh, Microsoft has blogged uh, twice about Windows 8 uh, this week. Once, one of them was about picture passwords. The other one was about centralized password sharing. It, it's sort of the a LastPass style functionality that they're apparently adding to Windows 8. I, I would just point out that the picture password information is not new. It's in the developer preview build. You can I use it now. In fact, it's one of the big 
demos that I show when I uh, demonstrate Windows 8. Um, there's also a PIN password. So if you're on a, a tablet type device or some, uh, some, some other type of device, you know, device like computing device, not a computer without a keyboard, uh, you can log in more quickly. So that stuff isn't, isn't uh, super new. So if you guys aren't familiar with the picture password thing we're talking about, it's where you would have an image on your lock screen of your, of your computer or tablet yeah. or whatever it is, and then you'll be able to do, draw a gesture on that image. So let's say you have a family picture or it's a picture of me and Paul, and you're like, I'm going to draw from nose to nose, and that's going to be my password. You like can do poke that. poke them in the eyes like the three stages. Exactly. And... It could be any kind of crazy gesture. The idea is that I, I believe it's, it's, it allows for a lot more uh, gestures instead of having a bunch of dots or a pin the the, yeah. the amount actually of I can show it to you oh you can show it. you can see it okay. go for it I was gonna say I can show it to you on my oh we're um, gonna see it if, it, if, it, if I can see it there's a picture of my wife and I think if I remember correctly like I have a yeah you uh, <laughs> you know hit in the eyes and do a smiley face and then you can log in with the um you'll log in that way now for people who are freaking out this is not replacing text passwords this is an addition no, to no 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 it's it's it is an addition to that's true of the pin password as well it's not a replacement for passwords. And don't they say the whole reason somebody might want to do this is because if you're on a touch tablet, it's easier to do yeah. that kind of a move instead of like typing in, you know, a long password while you're trying to hold a touch device. That's right. That's the thing. I find That's it, you know, for whatever thing. it's worth, I use uh, Windows 8 on a desktop computer and I actually configured mine for a pin password just because it's much quicker. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a much easier login. Yeah. I, I kind of like the, the image idea. It's kind of a... Although I could see people abusing this and being silly, and uh, of course. at least though, be, because of the different different style of uh, of gestures you could use here, you're not going to necessarily necessarily see that weird smear like, okay, your password is a Z, and you always see that very pre yeah, prominent like on, on a phone. Device. Yeah, yeah exactly. you might not have that because you can see. There you go. There's finger grease right there. You probably won't see that when you're like drawing smileys and this and that and the other thing on the Windows 8 device. I think it's I think it's a nice little gimmick. Uh, I I don't know if. It's not as gimmicky as uh, Android's face to unlock, but uh, you can use faces there. Uh, we have face to unlock in Windows as well, actually. Yeah. Well, it'd be <laughs> nice yes. if, if Nokia uh, would put a camera on the front of their phone. They will. One day. They will, just not here. <laughs> Beautiful phone, no yeah. front-facing camera for face to unlock. Uh, so there's been some weird reports about uh, a ribbon in Explorer. They're popping up now media. for some I, I, reason, Paul. This is my curmudgeon thing. I, I saw two news reports today that said, leaked builds of Windows 8 confirm ribbon in Explorer. The, the ribbon is in the Explorer build, or in the version of Explorer that's in the developer preview build at Microsoft, released publicly in September. This is not news. This is, it's there. It's there right now. It's, it's not December, new. Paul. That's the problem. I just, just, I know. So I, this is like, how to tell when people aren't paying attention. You know, that so, when someone says to you that this is news, they're not paying attention. They may not be where you want to go to read information about Windows 8. Just throwing it out. I'm not going to say who it is. I don't want to be a jerk about it. But so you suggest they go to winsupersite.com or all about Microsoft. Oh, yeah, absolutely. One of any any number of fine blogs <laughs> that are made by either her or I, I think, would be the uh, the way I would describe it. Very reliable. I will yeah. say that. Now, there's been some new Sky, SkyDrive functionality. Is this beyond the iOS and, uh, and and Windows Phone implementations, or is there more to the SkyDrive news this week? Yeah, this is, uh, uh, yeah, there is. This is yeah, major. I should take this. One. I was just gonna say this is two new posts about something they already announced, but not about iOS um, or Android. This this is further explanation about um, some of the uh, sharing simplification that they made to SkyDrive, and I think it was LiveSide that said, you know, they, they had two really long blog posts to explain how they simplified sharing and SkyDrive. And after you read them, you realize it's not so easy to share. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, right. it really, it shows you all the different things that you have to think about if you're creating one of these systems, you know, like, like say on SkyDrive, you want to share a photo with somebody who doesn't have a live.com or a Microsoft address like Hotmail. You know, it talked about how, you know, how you use it's basically how you use live as like a central repository for all your different addresses and how they resolve. And I mean, it, 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 everybody thinks, oh, how hard is it to share a document when you, you know, you have all these different addresses? Well, Microsoft made it sound hard and easy at the same time because they explained how they tried to simplify it, you know. So, I don't know if Paul, I don't know if you read those, Paul, but there's two, two new I, ones that came I, out this week. I did. And I didn't write about them because I don't quite understand what the point of them was. In other words, <laughs> um, 
SkyDrive has been interesting. I, I like SkyDrive and I use it. In fact, Mary Jo and I use it to do the show notes. And you're, you know, you're looking at them now, I would guess. Mm -hmm. um, I, some time ago, a month or so ago, they made a post. It was it, a very long post to the, Sky, to the Windows Live blog about their intention about SkyDrive. They, they didn't announce anything. They just said, look, here are the types of clouds that are out there. This is what SkyDrive does today. We, we know we need to take it to the next level. It, it, a lot of text with no actual explanation of where they were going. And then about a week later, they released a new version of SkyDrive. And I, I had been sharing uh, the show notes between Mary Jo and I and, and some of the folks at Twit uh, previous. And so I went and, and looked at, at what they did, and, and they've made sharing a lot easier. So if I was going to do this today, it would certainly be simpler. And I kind of like what they've done. But it, it's one of those things when you use SkyDrive, you can kind of immediately grok why it's better. It is simpler. It works better. It's more obvious. You know, in the past, you would have to select things Go over. I, I can't remember because it's different now. But it was very hard to find information about individual objects, uh, documents, or other files, or folders, or whatever. And now that stuff is just much easier. So, to me, that's like all you need to know. But they went and described in, in great detail over two blog posts how they implemented it, and it is um, it's somewhat bewildering. You know, there's a lot of information there. So, uh, I guess. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that to make something that's truly easy to use is often very difficult. And I think that was the point of the post. It was like, look, we, you know, we, we worked really hard on this. And uh, I think they're kind of proud of it or whatever. But, <laughs> but, didn't, uh, but yeah, didn't, it came out good. Came didn't out good. Dropbox show how easy you can share stuff? It's like, just set up a public thing. Well, uh, but we... Dropbox did it by, you got to remember, though, uh, Dropbox was a folder. Okay. You know, and Dropbox is doing basically sync between desktop computers and um you know, the cloud storage, which Microsoft has had for years, too. I mean, that's uh, and much more sophisticated than what Dropbox was ever doing. So um, it's not quite the same thing. I was thinking back, I think that Windows used to have a briefcase function. Do you remember that? Yep. You used to actually yep. sync up things. And, and then Absolutely. they had SkyDrive, which I started using in college, actually. That was, it wasn't SkyDrive then. I think it was called something else, but um, I liked it. I like the way it works. It's just, well, it just had, seems like it's... they had all like, kinds of, they had Sync Toy, which went through ah, various there versions. there we go. Uh, that was also for syncing from PC to PC. They had Live Mesh, which became Windows Live Sync, which became Windows Live Mesh, um, which, again, is a way to sync between PCs primarily, but also through uh, through some cloud storage that's related to, but not quite SkyDrive. And uh, SkyDrive is kind of their pure cloud uh, storage service that has been extended with the free Office apps, of course, which is fantastic, and integrates with their other services, including Hotmail. So if you send an email to people, you just want a vacation, you want to share a gigabyte worth of photos, rather than attaching them to an email, which no one would be able to get, you, those photos can automatically be copied up to SkyDrive. And what they'll see in the email is a link to them. And then they, they can view them from within the email, but it's actually up on SkyDrive. And so there's, there's some nice stuff going on there. Let's talk about some a deal that fell apart this week that people weren't expecting. AT&T abandoned the T-Mobile deal. They wanted to buy T-Mobile for $39 billion, and then the, uh, well, the government said no. It's a bad idea. They were being challenged, and then AT&T scrambled a bit before eventually saying that both AT&T and Deutsche Telekom have mutually agreed to not pursue the merger, and Deutsche Telekom will receive $3 billion in cash and, I believe, a billion dollars worth of spectrum. And, uh, Paul, you, you seem to have a unique viewpoint on well, the deal. <laughs> yeah, I don't get the reactions I've seen to this. There's been a lot, and I've gotten a lot of email from... Um, you know, consumer privacy groups and consumer advo advocacy groups were ecstatic that AT&T lost this deal. Because from their perspective, what happened was we are no longer going to have three major wireless carriers. We're going to have four. And that's, you know, four is better. There's more choice, better pricing, better competition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, everyone seems really excited about this. In fact, I even saw an article where someone wrote the big winner here is T-Mobile, clearly, because now they get to be independent and one of the big four and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's not what's happening here at all. In fact, T-Mobile may be one of the big four, but it's, you know, big four with the air quotes or the caveat there, which is that they're the littlest of the big four and the one who is in most trouble. And uh, Deutsche Telekom has been trying to get rid of these, uh, re get rid of this U.S. business for a long time because it's failing. And they have no strategy for the future at all. They had no plan B at all for developing a modern 4G slash uh, LTE infrastructure. So this company is, or this, uh, I guess, part of the company, if you will, is actually in a lot of trouble. And the reason they were for sale is because they were in a lot of trouble. And so it's it's nice that there's a fourth player, I guess, a fourth major player. But, I mean, T-Mobile could very well d devolve into 
being not much better than one of the regional carriers, you know, the um, the resellers of bandwidth, essentially, they're going to, they're probably going to have to license some other companies spectrum. I don't see how else they can survive as an independent entity. I just don't get it. So I, I look at this a little differently. Not that I, I thought for, you know, AT&T necessarily deserved them or whatever, but uh, they were the ones that made the most sense from a technological perspective. So it just seemed like a better deal than what did happen, but apparently I'm alone in that one. So, Mary Jo, are you shedding any tears for this this failed merger? You know, I, I'm I'm kind of of two minds of this whole about this whole thing. One is, anytime I can see a stronger competitor to Verizon arise, I'm happy because, especially because, as a Windows Phone user, I'm not happy with what Verizon's been doing, and I don't really feel like I have a lot of alternatives. I feel like AT and T is the company that's doing the most right now around the Windows Phone platform, but in New York, their coverage is nowhere near what Verizon's is. Um, and so that matters a lot to me. And I, I've really been think, you know, going back and forth, like what if Verizon doesn't get on the Windows Phone bandwagon, am I gonna go with AT&T or not? Um, yep. So, you know, from, from that perspective, I'd like to see a stronger, um, you know, company come up against Verizon. But I also do like the idea of, at least in theory of, of choice. So I, you know, I, the, I keep feeling like the more carriers, the merrier, and maybe that'll help us more than just having, you know, two two four hundred pound gorillas battling. And maybe it'll be better to have four two hundred pound gorillas battling. You know, <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe I don't know. I, I, you know? I, um, it, the, the, these things are never black and white. You know, people uh, I think largely thanks to the iPhone have, have developed this notion that AT and T is bad, and AT and T is everything that's wrong with the iPhone. And, you know, one of the things I discovered is that when you move from the iPhone to another phone, uh, all of a sudden the network starts working pretty well. And all of a sudden I can make phone calls and not get disconnected all the time. And that, hmm, maybe it wasn't uh, AT&T that was the problem uh, entirely. Um, the other thing is, in, in, you know, depending on where you live, uh, one of the weird things about wireless carriers is that you can't make any determination. You can't say Verizon is better than AT&T. It really matters on not just where you live, but where you're going to travel to and where you go, if anywhere. And in how you use the devices and so forth. And um, one of the things that I run into is we go to Europe every summer, um, usually for three weeks. And AT&T has tremendous international data plans that you can add on the fly by yourself using a website or from the phone itself, by the way. There's a, a wonderful mobile app that does this. And uh, my wife and my kids are on Verizon. And I asked her this week if she would look up what what would that look like on Verizon? If, if we go to Europe and we want to use your phone in, in Europe, how does that look? And it turns out that they also offer international data plans for subscribers, of course, but they're more expensive. You can't do it yourself. You have to go into a store or call Verizon to enable and disable those things. So they make it harder and they charge more for it. So, you know, we can go on and on about this kind of stuff, but it, it is not black and white and, and, and Verizon is not always better um, than AT&T. So it really depends on your needs. And um, I just, it's a, you know, again, this is just one of those things like people just repeat it as if it means something like AT&T sucks. You know, and it's like, well, it's, it's not really that simple. And I, uh, after getting the iPhone and uh, leaving Verizon for the first couple of years, I started thought, well, I, God, I can't wait to get back in Verizon. But now that Verizon is an option, uh, I'll be. I'm sticking with AT&T. I prefer it. It works better for you know for the way that I use the phone and the devices and and, and my particular needs. So I think that your mileage is going to vary. As in Verizon said publicly that the reason why they don't have more Windows phones is because that Windows Phone doesn't do LTE yet. I just yeah. You know who else doesn't do LTE yet? T -Mobile. Apple. <laughs> T-Mobile doesn't do it. They have, Windows, they have Windows phones there too. <laughs> Apple. Are they going to they're going to ban Apple devices too? I, I don't know. Just, how I was just wondering. I, I you know. Hmm. Would yeah. they ban there's Apple no, products? There's no correct answer to that one. <laughs> that was a trap. That was a trap. Nice. I should have seen that. And I should have said it. My name is Akhtar. It would have been funny. It's a trap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> there we go. We could get the screen of, of Admiral Akbar up there. But yeah, I mean, with this deal falling through, I mean, T-Mobile doesn't have a whole lot of options here. Deutsche Telekom's taking that money. They're going to pay off debts. They're not putting it in T-Mobile. And even if T-Mobile has more spectrum, it's not like they're going to be able to, um, I don't know, get customers. They, their churn rate's been pretty high. I mean, they're not doing so great when it comes to that. Uh, and, and the fact is they do have, they have some, I'd say, pretty good calling plans out there. But I don't know how long that's going to sustain them. If they don't have enough subscribers, how long yeah. could they continue? Um, 
I could see a bunch of these small regional carriers just getting together and just coming up with some kind of consortium name or like the way um, I think it was Cellular South rebranded to Seaspire and they kind of grew out a little bit long, a little bit bigger. I mean, the other thing is with Sprint going the way they're going, they they seem to be like, look, we'll we'll wholesale anything. You can have an MVO. I think yeah. I believe there's two MVNOs yep. on their network already with Boost and Virgin. So I would imagine if T-Mobile doesn't figure out what they're going to do, either they're going to resell their stuff, join up with Sprint, or be sold for parts. Well, I'm thinking sold for parts is probably Jeez. Deutsche Telekom's best option because it's probably worth more dead than alive at this point. Just like me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they're going to kill um, insurance money. Yeah, it's, it's, that's, a, that's a, a, a weird moment of introspection, by the way, when you realize that statement. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I could see that. I mean... You know, the wireless carriers are a lot like banking. You know, um, it takes a big bank like, you know, Bank of America to come up with a scheme where we're going to charge people for using an ATM machine, even though using an ATM machine is what saves them money. Um, in the same way that only the biggest wireless carrier in the United States would ever dream of, uh, you know, getting rid of uh, unlimited data, <laughs> and, you know, charging people just at the time when people are using more and more data. So maybe you get the better service and the better capabilities from the smaller companies going forward. And maybe that, maybe that is what restores some sense of normalcy to this market, or at least some sense of uh, competition. This thing of Verizon's coverage area is really, like, really growing with its 4G LTE. Well, LTE, 4G is, uh, as we've, we've discussed on, yep. on, on lots of different shows, kind of a useless term. There's HSPA+, Plus. there's LTE. Well, HSPA+, Plus is being marketed as 4G with T-Mobile, and part of AT&T's 4G network is HSPA+. Plus. Uh, but mm -hmm. LTE and YMAX used to be LTE, uh, used to be 4G. Anyway, my main point was Verizon's their coverage area is really good for LTE. Yeah. Have you heard any rumors or have you ever heard of them reselling their their uh, I guess bandwidth or it's not spec like having an MVNO on Verizon? Verizon. Because I don't think I've ever heard that before. Uh, I, I'm not sure. It doesn't um, Virgin Wireless is that Virgin's Verizon? on Sprint. They're on Sprint. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's why I was like, you know, if Verizon yeah, I, remains, I can't it, recall. Yeah, I'm surprised that well, they're making enough money. They're they're very profitable. They know what they're doing. I don't know if they need to even branch out. But I'm thinking, yeah, sure. that's why Sprint's going out of their way to continue to survive. And I'm and it, you could see Sprint and T-Mobile getting together. They don't have enough money to buy each they, other. Um, but, no, no, they could just have enough money to go down the tubes together. So, <laughs> <laughs> like money. Romeo and Juliet, it'll be nice. They're both gonna take a poison pill. <laughs> this, is, this is what you're. <laughs> yeah. That's how the wireless. <laughs> That's great. The big four to the big two, thanks to a death pact. And on that note, <laughs> let's thank oh, our sponsor. <laughs> let's thank a sponsor. So if you wanted to make a blog about something like this, what's going to happen to the wireless carriers out there, you can go to Squarespace. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. Now, Squarespace.com has an easy-to-use UI for creating and managing a website or blog. It's optimized for beginners and CSX, CSS experts. So if you know everything or know nothing, you'll be able to use this. Hundreds of design templates to choose from, and you can customize any of the designs to fit your needs. So if you don't want to use a template, you don't want to have a site that looks like everybody else's, you can take care of that. There are iPhone, iPad, and Android apps. So if you want to update your blog on the go, you can do that. Online resources and a special support team are available to give you personal help 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's an all-inclusive service, which gives you several modules to build your website. There's a blog module, which also has import and support for WordPress. So if you're moving from WordPress over, you could Blogger, Movable Type, and TypePad. Plus, there's export tools. So if you, for some reason, you try out Squarespace, you go, I don't like this, they won't keep your blog posts. You'll be able to export it out. It should be pretty easy. There's a form builder. So if you want to collect email addresses or other informations, uh, you can get it right from this module. Also, Flickr photo display. So if you have a bunch of photos you want to show, you can do that. Twitter widgets just show up automatically on your site. And if you're a business or if you're having, I don't know, a crazy party, there's even a module for Google Maps. So you can tell your people, go to my Squarespace site and you can actually see how to get to my place. There's all kinds of analytics too, website tracking, so you know how many times your site was viewed, and a built-in search engine optimizer. Now I used to work in certain places, and we have SEO. We had SEO experts. Okay, now you can use Squarespace as experts, and you don't need to know anything about keywords and metadata and none of that. It's all taken care of there. There's permission permission access handling, and there's cloud architecture for speed and site stability. You're not going to knock down a Squarespace site. Okay, you're not going to get uh, hit with the slashdot effect or whatever the new crazy thing the kids 
go to these days, the Twitter effect, I guess. Uh, you can use Squarespace for all your website needs. Build it, host it, and update it anytime for a free trial. Go to squarespace.com, and uh, you can sign up for a free account. And get this, there's no credit card needed when you sign up. You can try it out and start building your website. Then if you decide to purchase it, you can use the offer code WINDOWS12 and get 30% off for three months. That's squarespace.com and use the offer code WINDOWS12. And you'll save a bunch right there. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Windows Weekly. On to the listener Q&A. And we actually have a list of questions that I've I've, I've pre-selected because people were asking questions during the show. Stockpiled like a, like a squirrel with nuts. Yes, I am like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've often been compared to a squirrel. I've been distracted by squirrels. And, but thankfully, I've used my, my winter skills to create a list. So if you guys have questions, feel free to put them in the chat room. But here are a couple of them. Uh, when is the last time Paul has used Windows 3.1 for, it says rock group. But I'm pretty sure that's supposed to say work group. Last time I used it? Yep, last time. <laughs> I I mean, uh, okay, so the first version of Windows I ever used was Windows 3.0, but at the time, I was an Amiga user, and my wife had an IBM PS1, and I asked the guy at the computer dealer to make me a copy of it on four floppy disks or three floppy disks because it was, in my own words, there is no way I'm ever going to pay for this piece of whatever. And um, I hated it. I mean, I hated Windows, you know. Um, years later... Um, I had, uh, was involved uh, with a community college and I needed a version of Windows and that was kind of the most sophisticated one at the time. Windows NT was, I think, either, it was definitely out, but it was just too high end, you know, it didn't, wouldn't work on the computer I had. And there was a, even though it looked like Windows 3.1, Windows for Workgroups 3.1.1 or whatever it was at the time, um, had those underpinnings that later became, you know, part of Windows 95. And so I used that at that time before I used it in the build up to Windows 95. And until I switched over to Windows 95, you know, at some point during the beta, that is what I used. So that's been, what is that, 16, 17 years? It's been a long time. So there you go. That's what it looked like. Or it could look like, actually, it looks like any Windows, the old days. Yeah, I, I'm not going to be able to do this off the top of my head, but there were, there were two things you could enable in that operating system that just became features of Windows 95 that made it. Uh, less of the old-fashioned DOS plus Windows and more of the new fangled at the time seamless kind of OS. So there was some kind of a, I want to say, 32-bit disk access that would cut out the DOS mode stuff. And also a 32-bit, I think it was a flat memory address space option. If that, I'm not even sure if that's right. Something like that. It was a, uh, a way to break up the what was previously kind of a memory fragmentation issue you would get from running DOS, uh, which was a 16-bit OS. Okay. Does, does anybody remember window uh, Microsoft Streets? It's been a while. It's been a while. Streets and Maps? Streets and Maps is the question. Does anybody remember that? I, by the way, used it with a GPS device to navigate uh, to Vermont with a laptop. Recently? A no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you made it sound like Micro just, just yesterday. Micros well, but I've used it. I mean, Microsoft used to sell it with a little uh, GPS kind of a thing. I remember, remember it was a little piece of hardware. And we put it up on the dashboard. and I remember I going I, to Staples and seeing the box and going, oh, that's kind of neat. I can attach it to my yeah. laptop and I can, I can drive I think at around. the time it was a way, you know, it was a six hour drive or whatever up to Vermont. And uh, my kid, uh, my son at the time must have been very, very young. It was probably you know, like a baby car seat thing. And this was a way to keep him occupied on the trip because he could watch the progress on the map and he thought it was the greatest thing in the world. So, yeah. Uh, the simple times. <laughs> Uh, a question from Mary Jo. Did you see the Wired article where they call Microsoft the anti-Google? Do you agree with it? So even if you didn't read the article, do you, do you think Microsoft is the anti-Google? What would that even mean? They don't do search I was just well? going to ask, what does that mean? They don't I'm do ads sure and they don't do search. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> huh. Um, the anti-Google. No, I actually think Google um, is Microsoft Junior these days. Yep. I think Ooh. if you look at how Google's working and how they're operating and, and the attitude of the employees and how they do business, it's like Microsoft was around the time of Windows 95. Um, and I think that's why you're going to see them get in increasing trouble with Department of Justice and the EU and all because they're repeating a lot of Microsoft's mistakes. Which mistakes do you think they're repeating at this point? I mean, they, they seem to have a, um, they don't seem to be as division crazy as Microsoft is at Google these days. 
So what mistakes well, do you think they're doing? I guess I guess I'm just thinking mostly of, you know, thinking they can do anything they want in the search market the way that Microsoft used to think they could do anything they wanted in the PC software market and uh, trample over everybody and abuse monopoly power. You know, having monopoly power is not wrong, but abusing it is wrong. And I think that's where they're going to get tripped up because that's where all their cash reserves are just the way Microsoft's were all in office. I mean, I'm sorry, all in windows at the time. Um, and I think we're going to see unless Google kind of looks back at history and says, you know what, we're not going to get away with this. Just like Microsoft didn't, maybe we should change some of our um, business practices. I think, I think you're going to see them get in increasing trouble on the antitrust front. Just, yeah, just I, my I opinion. Agree. I agree with that completely. In fact, there's a weird thing that occurs where Microsoft spent its entire lifetime saying, we're not going to become the next IBM. We're not going to yep. become the next <laughs> IBM. Oh, my God, we're the next IBM. And, yep. and Google's whole thing has been, we're not going to be the next Microsoft. And guess what? Yeah, you are. And mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I also think they're going to run into the same, kind of, same kinds of problems, definitely. Jimmy Fallon in the chat room says, Android is the new Windows and Windows is the new Apple. It's like, wow. okay, kind I, don't of, know about the I guess he means, I guess I mean, he means OS Android's, X, really, on the, on, the, on the mobile front, I'm thinking. Android is absolutely the next Windows. It's the same kind of Wild West approach, um, you know, that Windows did. So yeah. So you don't think you don't think Windows is that counter Windows Phone is in the counter culture OS ten for creative types, whatever the heck. I don't, I don't think these things always line up for that evenly or that neatly. Um, it could be a market so I'm not share. Sure. Joke. I, don't, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I don't know. Windows. The thing is, and I think you talk about Windows Phone primarily. I mm -hmm. guess right. Yes. I mean, Windows Phone is is informed by things of the past that Microsoft did. So it's not that it's not that clean to say, but it's very easy to look at Android and say, yeah, this is the Windows model. In fact, it's working out exactly the same way. You have multiple hardware makers selling this to consumers. It's even more open than Windows was. So they're able to change the UIs. They're able to make different things. And in that way, uh, you know, Google has in some ways stolen the best ideas of Windows, but then really kind of screwed up some of the stuff that Microsoft got right, you know, that they don't have as much of a control over um, Android as maybe they should. And that's something, you know, Microsoft did get right, I think, with Windows Phone, although obviously uh, that's not selling so well, so maybe that's hard to say. Although I but think one, one big difference between Android and Windows, if you're comparing those two things, is people weren't so patent suit happy back around the time when Windows was was kind of well, up and coming. Well, there was one right? company. I mean, actually, actually, issue. yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, actually, one there company, were, right? right? Just one. There, yeah. Well, there weren't that many players back then, right? I mean, there weren't so that we many more players. players. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny. If, if if you try to draw these parallels, you could say, you know, why why didn't Apple sell, uh, sue Dell and HP and Compaq and whoever else was around at the time? Um, but, you know, basically, the only other OS vendor on Earth was, in fact, so, you know, suing Microsoft during much of that time period. So maybe there are some parallels. Uh, it's, it's just, it's now there are just too many plays. I mean, I think, I think it's the, the nature of Android with all of those um, OEMs that are making the hardware. They're, you know, they're almost, and, and because Google's giving it away, I mean, that's the big difference, right? You know, Microsoft was selling Windows. So maybe that was the end point. You could go, to, you could go and sue them. I don't understand why Google giving away Android makes it okay. You know, we've stolen your intellectual property, but we're not making a profit on it, so it's okay. It's fun. <laughs> you know, I don't get that. But uh, different not, attitudes. You know, you know these not a these, lawyer, uh, these California you know. people. They're weird. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Throw out of this. <laughs> uh, have Have you guys heard any rumors of, of a Virgin Mobile ever getting a Windows OS, well, Windows Phone device? I haven't. No. no. Anybody? No. Mm -mm. Is there a Windows Phone on Sprint? Does anybody know? Yes. There, there is. is one. The uh, HTC Arrive or Arrive or however you say that is on Sprint. Okay, That's the one with the key, the key, real keyboard that you pull out. This is the first gen phone, right? Not the. Yeah. Yeah, they don't have a new one yet, I guess. I do not think they do. Let's see, and then a question for Paul: What prestige level are you in Modern Warfare Three? <laughs> <laughs> um, I always forget. I think it's fourth. Uh, it's the purple one, whatever that is. It's the purple one. My, my son comes home from school every day and he says, what level are you? And I always disappoint. I have no way. I don't really, I don't pay attention. I don't know. Four? Is that a level? 41? I don't know. I, I don't that, know. That might be the title of the show. What level he, are he you? He lives in, what's that? That might be the title of the show. What level are you? Yeah, what level are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think it's the purple level? prestige, I think. Yeah, the purple one. <laughs> the purple one. Maybe that could be the alternate title. Or we told you so. I'm just I'm kicking around ideas. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, um, we told you so. 
When will Microsoft get better marketing? Why is it so bad? I, I'm assuming this this fellow in the chat room is referring to it's a great time to be a family, those series of ads, <laughs> which I know we've discussed before. I think we've discussed it when I've been on this show because we're all like, I, I, you know, there's some apartment? Windows phone ads that are on TV now. I've actually, you know, we, you watch a TV show uh, that you've DVR and you kind of click through the commercials and then you see something that clearly is a Windows phone commercial. And you go back and you think, and because I don't, I don't see a lot of Windows phone commercials on TV, what is this? Um, they're not so horrible, you know, some of them. Well, th wait, that's the Windows phone ads. These, is this a Windows phone ad right now, Alex? This is not. It's just a marketing thing. Okay, because there's a lot of, man, what we talked about. See, this looks horrible. Yep. I, I don't know. I, I was going to ask you, was that guy singing? And I guess he is, and that's terrible. Let's turn it up. Let's get, lo let's get sued. Cause it's the cool so this should be the new Microsoft thing? Is that what you're trying to tell me, Alice? <laughs> did this, this ever this actually is become a commercial? Remember Songsmith, Paul? It, it was like this thing from Microsoft Research. Um, uh, but I don't think uh, that was ever a real commercial, was it? Please tell uh, me no. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, that just reminded me of the, of the Windows uh, Vista parties ads. Was that? Yeah. Same guys? Yeah. Same advertising company? Remember Joe and I had a Windows Vista party, didn't we? We oh, did. Oh, no, that was Windows 7. Oh, wait. Was it, was it, I'm, having, I'm, I'm having so much trouble remembering. Was it a Vista was party? Was it was a seven parties. I can't remember no. which one it was. We, uh, we, had, we had a, seven a really party. good. We had a good Windows Seven party. We did not yeah. do a Vista party. Yeah. <laughs> we, had, we had four balloons. Uh, that's how great it was. Somebody asked, did, and I think we've answered this before. Do you expect Windows Eight to sell as much or more units uh, compared to Windows Seven? <sighs> right. No. You know, I, I. This is a tough one because yeah. it depends on how they do this. So. Uh, I have said before that uh, for Windows 8 to be successful, it needs to be better than what Vista was. And people exaggerate how bad Vista was. They f seem to forget this thing sold like 300 million copies a year or whatever. Um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. I, I don't know. I mean, Windows 7, like Windows XP, was sort of the benefit of timing. You know, Vindo Windows Vista was a, a disaster, comparatively speaking. Certainly was perceived to be a disaster. So Windows 7 was perceived to be so much better. People seem to buy a lot of it. So, you know, the market grows and changes and maybe, uh, you know, I don't know. It, it's it's you, really... I'd say one thing we can say. To you, via your this, you found the Windows yes, party? Yes, magically, your iPod is connected through a time warp <laughs> to October 27th. I'm sorry, October 22nd, 2009, the <laughs> day... Windows 7 came out. Do we have the rights to this, here Alex? He is the man who made it all happen, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Theroux. <laughs> yes. Super safe for Windows. <laughs> it all it's all his doing. Hey, Paul. Uh, I was in a hotel room in New York. Day. I remember this. I was laying on the bed, I think. Oh, man. It could bring be. us Microsoft's huddle masses. Because I find myself huddled over. Comfortable. Mm. Uh, no, I think I think when we're talking about Windows 7, Windows 8, one thing you can say, at least right now, unless something, again, radically changes, is... I'm betting Windows 8 will sell less with the enterprise than Windows 7 did. Yeah. Because um, a lot of the a lot of businesses are right now still in the middle of upgrading to Windows 7 and I'm I'm thinking they're going to be somewhat likely to skip over Windows 8. I think I mean I Windows wonder, 8 I think is going to do pretty well in the tablet space actually. I mean that's I think yeah. consumers are going to be like, "Hey, what's that? Oh, that's Windows 8. Let's try it out." Actually, they're not going to I really don't think consumers really care what the operating system is, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. They just want to grab a piece of hardware and if it's made well enough, and it responds well, they'll just go, yeah, I'm just going to buy this one. If it's powered on in the store. That's something else I've noticed. Um, and, and going <laughs> yeah. shopping in real life. It can be a problem at your typical Best Buy. Right, there's like an iPad that's charged. <laughs> but if you want to try any of the Android devices, you can, you can just, hopefully you brought a charger from home. Because yeah, it's not charged sure. there. So if, if Microsoft, and I hear they're putting some real money into this anyway. Well, you know, well you, it makes sense because uh, Best Buy has a huge tablet section now and they're de-emphasizing PCs, so maybe they can get involved in that little bit of magic um, <laughs> whenever that comes out. We'll see. And before we get to the picks, let's thank our final sponsor, which is Netflix. Now, Windows Weekly is brought to you by Netflix. Watch, you can watch uh, thousands of movies and stuff. You guys know about Netflix, right? You can stream thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly. It means you save time, money, and hassle. And there's really easy ways to access uh, Mo streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch them on your Mac, your PC, an iPad, iPhone, Android phones. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what device you can't watch it on. Maybe you can't watch it on your toaster yet. 
but I'm telling you, that's probably coming. If you have a gaming console, you could use that. If you're not a gamer, there's a Roku box. Your Blu-ray player probably has it. Apple TV. It doesn't matter pretty much. Whatever device you got probably has Netflix. And with Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices. And get this. Let's say you're at home. You're watching a movie. You, wanna, you need to go out. You can continue watching that same movie at the same place with your portable device because it'll pick up right from there. You can finish it on a different device. Whichever ways you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want anytime. You're not buying one movie at a time. You're getting streaming. You can watch hours and hours. You want to sit there and have a marathon of Sons of Anarchy? You can do that. And you're not gonna, it's not going to cost you any more than watching, well, just that one flat right there. And you can cancel at any time. You can try Netflix today for 30 days for free. Go to Netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use that URL when you sign up, Netflix.com slash twit. It knows that we sent you there. We thank Netflix for their support of twit, and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. And by the way, if you if you've already have this and you've tried this out, this Netflix promotion, go out there and tell your friends about it. Or go to their computers and just you know, put in Netflix.com slash twit. Sign them up. Helps us out. On to the picks. Using the Xbox 360 as a TV replacement. I bet you could do that using Netflix, actually. Um, actually, that would be one of the components. So, so you know, Net Netflix and Hulu and NBC Today and a couple of other things were available previously. But uh, thanks to the recent dashboard update, Microsoft has been adding new content providers at kind of a furious pace. So I've been, I've been writing a review and kind of an ongoing review of this dashboard update. And I meant to finish this before the show, but uh, probably sometime tonight, I'll publish the third part of that review. But then the fourth part will involve all of these media services. So I'll, I'll have the full rundown eventually. But as of today, uh, there's probably in the United States, maybe 20 or 15 or 20 of them. And then depending on where you live elsewhere in the world, there are a variety of um, services available. So if you haven't, especially if you have one of the new consoles, you know, the, the black um, S series uh, Xbox 360 consoles, which are much quieter and much more reliable than the original console. Um, this isn't just a video game machine. It's a set-top box. It, it provides 1080p uh, HD uh, quality video, and some of these services are really, really high quality. Netflix looks great on there. Um, if, I, if you're a, a Verizon Fios customer, you can use uh, an Xbox 360 as a secondary TV, and you don't get the full programming, but you get some of the live shows. There are about 20 or 25 of them today, and they're going to be adding on demand soon as well. So... There's a lot of great stuff out there to check out, definitely. Yeah, that's good. Go ahead. Hmm? I was going to say, the only caveat is you have, to, you have to have an Xbox Live Gold account to access most of the stuff on the console. That's Which, of course, you do it. because you're such a huge Xbox fan. It's definitely cheaper than, than going with a full-on cable package anyway. I mean, the other thing is, if there's <laughs> yeah. the YouTube app now that's available on Xbox 360 that mm -hmm. rolled out in a beta, and then it came out to everyone soon. I mean, actually, pretty recently, that is. And yep. I mean, Google's been throwing tons of money into YouTube, and there's lots of content on there that's high quality. So, I mean, including... I, I don't... Um, yeah, there's some good stuff. I don't necessarily recommend this, especially for people who listen to this podcast, but there's some, there's some additional functionality you get uh, on the 360 that's not available elsewhere. So, for example, like you said earlier, you can get Netflix in other places, obviously. You can get Hulu uh, in other places. But a lot of these services support some unique Xbox 360 functionality, like Beacons, where you can put out a... Um, uh, it's sort of like a general invite just to say people, uh, so it will go out anytime you're watching, say, Netflix or YouTube. And you can say, hey, anyone else who's on my friends list when I'm doing this, you're welcome to join me. And they have these kind of virtual rooms where your little avatars get together and you can chat over the headset and you can watch videos together and interact in ways um, that are actually fairly unique. And again, I'm, I'm, you know, 45 years old, so I don't do this stuff personally, but I could see some younger people uh, <laughs> being interested in that. So it's, it's certainly it's available. I don't think the Xbox knows age limit. You can go ahead and, and still use that. Uh, um, it's not good. So we go on to the software pick of the week? Sure. sure. Um, this is one I've not used personally. This was recommended to me uh, from a listener. I, I just wanted, in fact, it's been sitting on the back burner for a while now. I apologize for that. But um, there's some interesting interactivity, if you will, between Windows Home Server, the latest version, and the Mac. So now in the, in the new version, 2011, it can do, uh, you can back up your Mac to the server and so forth. But n now... With this add-on called Netatalk, you can actually use Windows Home Server as if it were a time machine. Uh, as a, I'm sorry, as if it were a time capsule, right? Which is the device that Apple sells to do uh, centralized backups from Mac OS X. I think it's Snow Leopard and Lion both support time machine. So now with this add-in, you can use uh, if you're using Home Server, so if you have a mix of uh, Windows PCs and, and Macs in your house, 
uh, you can have all the backups be centrally located on the home server uh, using Netadoc. Netatalk. And I don't, Sandic is the only name I have for this guy. I apologize, but thank you for that tip. And then for, the, for those of you, for those few people out there that don't have both Windows Home Server and Macs, um, I would just uh, remind people that Link uh, 2010 came out this week for the iPhone and the iPad in, in unique versions for both of those. So if you have Link at work or Office 365, uh, you can use uh, Apple's iOS devices to access Link as well. And uh, Paul, I'd just like to point out that your link for Netatalk uh, redirected to this. Yes, that's not what you want. Okay. <laughs> I got it to work fine on my computer. I don't know what happened. Um, that's interesting. Are you using IE? Yeah. yeah. Like, it's running fine on Chrome. Yeah, let me... Uh, or Chrome da. <laughs> Well, let, me put sure a different, let me put a different link into the show notes. Yeah, there it is, and you right can, there. Uh, this is the link. This is Netatalk. You can, you can use Bing. Find Netatalk. <laughs> this happened to me today on Twitter. I, I recommended a link by Robert X. Cringely, and people who were using, hitting it with IE were telling me that they were getting a, a fake AV thing. Maybe that's just something I send out as a little reminder to people to use Chrome instead. I'm <laughs> not really sure how that happens, but... Well, I'm sure it's it'll right. be fine. Once in the show notes, we'll have a link that that works. I think nicely. everything I cut, anytime I cut and paste a URL in Windows, it just goes out as a as some kind of a fake AV thing. <laughs> On to the enterprise pick of the week, Mary Jo. What do you got? Um, so I I'm, I'm making a last minute substitution. <gasps> uh, Surprising. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm going to do um, for the enterprise pick of the week because it just came out this afternoon. The Office 365 integration module for. Windows SBS 2011 Essentials. That's a mouthful. Um, what it really means is, if you remember the old code name Aurora, which was Microsoft's hybrid cloud on-prem server for small businesses, um, the whole idea of that product, which came out this past summer, was that you were going to be able to integrate directly with Office 365 and other cloud-hosted services like CRM Online and all um, from your on-prem SBS server, small business server. Um, the only problem was when it came out in the summer, there was no plugin for Office 365. That module wasn't done. And they said at the time, it'll be ready this fall. Well, it's ready today. It actually is finally mm -hmm. out. Um, and it's called OIM, OIM, <laughs> Office 365 Integration Module. No, I am not making that up. They actually are using that as the acronym. OIM? Um, so, OIM. <laughs> they, they, I mean, they could have, I guess they could have, like, done a camel spelling, so it's like O-I-M or, or O-M. I, I don't know why they, oh, wow. Okay. But it's for small <laughs> yeah. businesses, so the name isn't necessarily as important as um, Exactly. As for good consumers. point. Very good point. And so it's a free download. You can go get it off the download center as of December 22nd. If you're using SBS and you want to link it up with your Office 365, now you can using this module. You know, it's crazy because Microsoft always has really cool code names to the point that we have code name pick of the weeks on this show. And then when they come out with products, they have these ridiculous names. Uh, Mary Jo, what's the code name pick of this week? Okay. Just because you loved the Hadoop stuff so much I today, we're going to stay in that theme with the code name pick of the week. And this week, the code name is Isotope, which is a very unusual code name because Microsoft's been doing, <clears throat> excuse me, mostly cities lately. <clears throat> and isotope, as you know, uh, which I looked up just to make sure I had the correct definition, is two or more forms of the same element that contain the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. So there's your science wow. lesson for the week. <laughs> um, so why would they pick isotope for, for the Hadoop products? Well, think about it. Um, what they're going to do is allow you, if you use Hadoop on Windows or Hadoop on Azure, they're going to allow you to mix and match with all these different um, backend data services. Um, some of these will be open source services, some will be Microsoft data services. And so I think that's why they picked the isotope name that they're, the core of all of these things is Windows uh, Windows Hadoop, basically. And then all the little different differentiations are going to be the things that you pull in um, from Microsoft, from third parties. And that's that's why they're calling it Isotope. So Isotope is the code name for Windows, uh, Azure Hadoop, and Windows Server Hadoop, and all of those things around it. Wow, that's hard to say. Windows Azure Hadoop. There you go. <laughs> I, I was feverishly looking for a city named Isotope, and uh, I can't find one. You can only find something. There's a place called Isotope in San Francisco, or there's that uh, there's that minor league baseball team in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So if you can, yep. it's not a city. Uh, yeah. So Microsoft breaking protocol here. How dare they? Yes. 
go with that. <laughs> um, I think that wraps up an episode of Windows. This episode of Windows Weekly, we survived. You guys are actually gonna be back next week, right, for a, a live episode of Best and Worst of, I believe. Yes. Of yes. Microsoft, not not of this show. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yep. let, let's 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 do the the promotional stuff. Well, where can people find you? And, and I'm pretty sure they, they, you cover uh, Windows stuff, right? And Microsoft stuff? Occasionally. Occasionally. Yeah. Yes. I know you, you dabble in that. Uh, maybe the, I, uh, thought, I thought so much of it, I put it into my site name, <gasps> oh. I guess. Oh, but I yes, thought uh, that most, was about like, not the opposite of losing. Like, it's about, no, yes, it should be. Maybe it will be. It's someday. about motivational techniques. Wins right. You don't, want, you don't want to get motivational techniques from me. That would be ugly. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, I, most of my stuff goes through the super site for Windows. I'm also uh, on Windows IT Pro, of course. And on Twitter, at the Rots? On Twitter, at the Rots. That's right. T-H-U-R-R-O-T-T. -T. Are you on social? Microsoft's um, experimental? No, I am not. What? I have too many social networks as it is. <laughs> I'm, but it's for I'm students good. and research and something or yeah, other. Yeah, I'm, I'm nothing I'm of those, so it's fine. Mary Jo, are you on social? I am not either. Nope. I'm, I'm being antisocial and not on social. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so where can people find you and your work on the internet? Yes, they can find me on allaboutmicrosoft.com. I also like Microsoft so much, I added them to my domain name as well. Nice. Um, that's my ZDNet blog. And then I am on Twitter, Mary Jo Foley, all one word. That's long. So it's Mary Jo Foley, all one word? Yes. Let's just <laughs> type it all out. And... Yes. Uh, you can find me over there. I'm going to be on the set of TNT in about, a, about an hour. So uh, that does it for this episode. Thanks for watching, everybody, or listening, and or if you did both, congratulations. I'm glad you watched and listened. See everybody next week. Well, they will. John's done tweaking the monitor. How does that look? I don't know. Okay. Audience, chat room, do you like the way this looks now? I think it's good enough. You think it's good enough? Mary Jo looks like she's coming yeah. from the Death Star, you know, before it was completed. <laughs> Why? Because <laughs> no, it's just kind of dark. It's like... It is. <laughs> it's got that kind of metal, dark, weird... Uh, That's too bright. Why? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the chat room. Oh, XYZ's baking a pizza. That's good. That's very, very relevant, and uh, I hope you are bringing it over to the studio because um, we could use that. Let's see. We've got a Ford ad. We've got a Squarespace ad. We've got a Netflix ad. We have no ads for, uh, for Audible, so save it. Fine. Save it. The right, I, can I can tell you what I got from Netflix this week. That It just arrived. You yes. know what I discovered was if I try to uh, play a DVD while we're recording uh, over Skype, uh, my Skype window is not full, it's not uh, widescreen, it goes four by three. How strange does that make is any that? sense? I don't know. Like, how does that, how, how do they I don't know, I think, I think the, four, the, the widescreen HD thing is based on processor availability, processing power availability, something like that. Let's see, so the question is, has Paul not shaved today? We'll put that one in there. <laughs> I could, I, as I've told people, my my hair grows very quickly. I could probably squeeze a beard out before the end of the show if I strain my face hard enough. Okay, there's another question. MS DOS, dude, you got some great questions because I'm saving oh. all these. If I want to run uh, Doom on a 386 PC, what's the best command lined boot up scheme to use? I don't even remember what it's called anymore. Remember that you used to have to edit a a batch file so it would like only load certain things in memory. I don't remember anything before 2010. So yeah, you're probably. I took, I took a, a knock to the head. So sure. <laughs> That's why you're in Petaluma. That's exactly how I got to Petaluma. I woke up one day. I'm like, <laughs> what am I doing here? Like, oh, you have a job here. I said, okay. You don't. You don't go to Petaluma. You just kind of end up in Petaluma. Yeah, it's 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 it, you know that's uh, that's how a lot of people end up here. Right. <laughs> We're recording. Yep. You ready? I don't know. You, you, okay. Now you're ready. Wake up. <laughs> that was violent. Oh, I love them. I love that melting clock. I'm going to steal that. <clears throat> okay, so it's time for Windows Weekly. Is that what the thing is? Sure. Is that what the show is? Uh, yeah. Sure. Might be Mac break. I don't know. This is Mac break week. <laughs>
<laughs> Start purple back there. And the freaking <laughs> and everyone would leave in droves. <laughs>